uh, this, we're gonna, I'm going to walk you through this. There's three, three phases to this presentation. One is some general thoughts I have about entrepreneurship. I've worked for seven entrepreneurs, and as Sarah mentioned, I've worked for a New York Stock Exchange listed company that made automotive parts. I'm going to talk about some of the businesses I worked in and give you a profile of the background of the entrepreneur and what happened, how, how did they get control of their entrepreneurial opportunity and what was the starting issues that they were faced with. And I want to see what you think about what they should be doing and then I'll tell you what they did. And then I'm going to kind of conclude with uh, what I would be doing now if I was in your shoes and I wanted to be an entrepreneur so that you can prepare yourself for the future. And I know it's not a large group, that's no problem at all. Um, one of you might be a, a future Bill Gates. Uh, I actually went to college with Melinda Gates at Duke University and I knew her when, uh, before she went to work for Microsoft and met Bill Gates. All right, so general thoughts about entrepreneurship. Um, first of all, my perspective. Actually, when I was uh, about your all's age, I was uh, an intern in Washington D.C. and wrote a paper for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers called Public Policy Aspects of American Small Business Technological Innovation. When you write a paper, you have to have a long title. And it was published and I re received the Frederick W. Taylor Management Award from ASME for my paper. I mean, this is how far back I, I go. When I was a student at, at Stanford and Duke, um, I organized a day-long entrepreneurship conference. I actually picked those schools because I wanted to know why Silicon Valley and why Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, were such economically vibrant communities with new business formations. And in 1982, Steve Jobs was my keynote speaker at Stanford. And Howard Head was his counterpart, the other keynote speaker. Howard Head invented the Prince tennis racket and the Head snow ski. We had the, many of the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley attended this conference. Uh, some of them had told me afterwards they really had missed the boat in, in not investing in Steve Jobs in the first round, but he looked like a hippie and when he was first round, uh, long hair, you know, and they said, this guy isn't going anywhere. <laughs> so when he, when he got all clean shaven and all in the second round of financing, it cost a lot more money for those venture capitalists to invest. But anyways, I go way back. I've been a business plan judge. I think now they use the term business model, I believe, in some of the colleges and competitions. Uh, um, but I've been a business plan judge at some of the universities looking at commercializing ideas that students have. My wife and I, uh, we actually sponsor a scholarship in Indiana to a graduating high school student. It's administered through a community foundation. Um, and we had to really work with that foundation on the selection criteria because it's not always the A student that becomes the entrepreneur. Uh, I've always reported to the entrepreneur or found, founder in the non-publicly held companies I've, I've worked in. And I've worked in, as you can see, a range of industries, uh, every functional area except human resources. And uh, I was also a McKinsey consultant. Um, many of you might not be familiar with McKinsey. 99% of America isn't. But Forbes magazine a few years ago, quite a few years ago, did an article on McKinsey, front cover story, they said the three greatest institutions on the face of the earth, the Catholic Church, the Marines, and McKinsey. And most people have never heard of them. McKinsey, when you graduate with your MBA, the two primo jobs is Goldman Sachs in investment banking and McKinsey in management consulting. They're usually hired by Fortune 500 companies to work on really tough problems related to corporate strategy or acquisitions. Uh, the board is usually who hires them. And uh, back in the 80s when I worked for them, we would bill a client $300,000 a month for us to work on a project. So that really limits who you can work for and what kind of projects you can work on. Several U.S. presidents hired McKinsey to put together the organizational structure for the White House. It's really a wonderful opportunity that I had when I graduated from business school. Um, general thoughts about entrepreneurship. The basic building blocks. Um, our desire, uh, the ones I have listed here, and, and I can't emphasize enough the first two. You know, you're never going to get in life what you don't want. Now, just because you want it doesn't mean you're going to achieve it or get it, but you've got to want it first. And you often hear how important attitude is in business and in being successful in life. And quite honestly, 
uh, attitude is very important. But I could take somebody that has a bad attitude, and if they have a strong desire for something, their strong desire will trump their bad attitude. It's like, you know, rock, scissors, paper, stone. You know, the paper covers the stone. Desire just trumps everything. And so often you find the most successful entrepreneurs came from rather humble backgrounds, and they grew up in some exposure to poverty, and that built a strong level of desire. You know, to a certain extent, I would say growing up in a wealthy family is probably a disadvantage to becoming an entrepreneur because you don't get the strong do dose of desire that you need to really achieve great success in life. A passion and vision. Now, those aren't my terms. Those are Steve Jobs' terms. In 1982, he said, Apple was all about vision to see what was possible and passion to make it happen. And that is true about every entrepreneurial business. You've got to be looking down the road to see, really, where is this industry going? What kind of problems are my customers going to have? You have to have a vision of what is possible. And then you have to have a passion for that to make that happen. And most observers, when they look at the entrepreneur, they go, wow, that's a real hardworking person. To the entrepreneur, they're just doing what they enjoy because they have a passion for it. And whether you become an entrepreneur or not, you've got to uh, engage your work has got to be somehow associated with your passions. That's, you can't achieve success in a competitive world like we have today without having some passion for what you're doing. Uh, of course, you need an idea. Um, you see, I see a lot of business plans where it's really a technology in, in search of a problem. It's so much better if you've discovered the problem and now you're looking for a technology to develop a solution for that problem. You know, that's what I call a more of a customer-driven approach to entrepreneurship than a technology-driven. Many, many business plans are a technology in search of a problem. But you want a problem. Uh, you need some money to get started. You need team building skills. Uh, one of the universities I work with, uh, they're developing an innovation center and the person responsible for that did a, did a, a little analysis. He looked at all the names on the buildings on their campus and he looked at what their, and these are people that obviously donated a lot of money, that's how you get your name on a building. And usually it has some, it, they're former students. So he could go into the administration office and look up their grades when they were students, and he was stunned to find out that they tended not to be very good students, okay? And what I discovered is, I was the A student, I was summa cum laude, uh, and what I discovered was that, um, you know, the difference between being the B student and the A student requires enormous amount of extra work. And that extra work takes away from developing other kinds of skills in life. And it just turns out that those other skills are really important to being successful in business because business is truly a social experience and you've got to have good social skills. And that's what happens with the B and C students. They're doing something else to develop those skills and the A student isn't. Now, I realize I'm talking here in an academic institution. So don't all run home and tell your parents, I don't need to get, get that A in class. I mean, you should strive to be the best student you can, but not at the expense of developing good social skills because business is a social experience. And lastly, you're going to need some customers, okay? Those are really the fundamental blocks to get started. Um, entrepreneurial characteristics. This is usually some sort of a topic in an entrepreneurship course. And I'm going to talk about some of these entrepreneurs. Um, but it helps if you're a bit of a misfit, okay? The seven entrepreneurs I've worked for, five of them wouldn't last 10 minutes in anybody else's organization. The other two would, okay? So you don't have to be in a misfit, but it sure helps if you are, okay? If you somehow feel that you just don't fit in, okay? Because, again, business is a social experience and large organization. In fact, business is precisely exactly like high school with cliques and groups. And so if you were a type of person that meshed real well between the different cliques and groups and had tons of friends, you're going to find that when you get into a, an organization that you're going to like it, the organization is going to like you, and they're going to advance you. But if you're a bit of a misfit and don't fit in and, and you feel like a foreign body in an, an organization, <laughs> you know, entrepreneurship's really the way you're going to want to go, and that's the way a lot of these misfits are. Um, they also have a desire to create your own perfect world because part of this is 
is that you, you pick the team you want, you pick the rules of engagement. Yes, you have to live within what the uh, rule of law says you can and cannot do, but you can create a, an environment and a work schedule and a lifestyle that really fits you. And a lot of these entrepreneurs are driven by creating their own perfect world. They're very independent. I call smart and hardworking. That doesn't mean they got the A, but you know what? I mean, they're somehow savvy or they got street smarts. Um, they don't, you know, they, they have lots of energy. I haven't met a successful entrepreneur that didn't have high energy. And, and they provide a lot of their self-motivation. You don't often get encouragement in life. I mean, you know, you may from a boyfriend or a girlfriend or from a spouse, but the world around you often doesn't give you encouragement. In fact, it gives you discouragement. So you have to provide your own encouragement. Um, most importantly, entrepreneurship is a way of life. It is not a get-rich-quick scheme. So when I started this by, by asking you all to think about why you wanted to be an entrepreneur or you think you do, hopefully the focus wasn't money, okay? Because if the focus is money, you're going to not make the right kind of decisions that will allow your enterprise to thrive and prosper. Because a lot of times, doing the right thing for your business to survive means making a compromise on the P&L. Right? And so you have to think of it as a way of life rather than making money quickly. Even these, inter these app applications and smartphones, th those types of businesses, there were a lot of hours that were put into developing those apps or the software. Um, by the way, it is not at all shocking to me as to why so many of these apps and internet-based businesses were started by young people. And it's not just because they're a little bit more tech savvy. If you think about what you need to start a business or to buy a business, which are the two routes to being an entrepreneur, um, if, you want to, if you're going to start a business, I mean, these internet-related startups are not capital intensive. They don't require tons of money. You can take a computer science major, or a few of them, lock them up in a room, slide food under the door, and they'll program away and be super happy and out comes some new internet business. I mean, they don't require millions of dollars like a manufacturing company does. So it is, it is inevitable, it's perfectly logical that this is where these kinds of businesses get started because when you're 20 or 21 or 22, you don't have a lot of money, you have time, okay? And these are the perfect kinds of businesses to start. And that's why they get started. Um, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the business, uh, some of the entrepreneurs that I work with and explain how they became entrepreneurs because I want you to realize there's many different ways that this evolves uh, in life and it also is, it's very independent as to what your background is, although I do believe being poor helps uh, growing up in a poor, struggling family. Um, one of the first entrepreneurs I worked for was in Indiana. Uh, the person who started this was a son of a, of a preacher, a Baptist preacher. Uh, he went to Auburn University, got a bachelor's degree in industrial management, and he had worked in manufacturing uh, in, after college uh, in um, various uh, kinds of businesses that, that made um, uh, parts, either switches or sheet metal parts, etc. And by the time he got to be 35, he, uh, he had advanced up to being vice president of a company on the American Stock Exchange. And this company was a diversified business that had about 20 small manufacturing companies, and their balance sheet in the PNL became over leveraged, and they had the banks, you know, squeezing them. And so they needed to sell off some of their divisions. And so this person put together a business plan, and he has probably very modest means at, at that point in life, and he put together a business plan to do a leverage buyout to purchase uh, one division one year, and the next year he went back and bought a second division. Um, the kinds of products that this company made are uh, electrical switches that are used in machine tools, okay, Actually, this was a competitor to Alan Bradley, uh, this business, which Alan Bradley, of course, is from here. And then uh, the other business he bought 
made uh, NEMA, what they call NEMA enclosures and wireway. These are uh, electrical boxes. It's the box itself that houses the electrical control that's used in a factory, okay? And um, so uh, what do you think, he, so he, he, he put together a deal, look at the assets in the business, went to some lending institutions, got the uh, capital to acquire these two businesses on a leveraged deal, and uh, again, the, the parent company was over leveraged. The, the businesses were located in the Detroit area, one of which was in a very rundown area. I remember him telling me stories on Saturdays they would, they would uh, take a gun and look for rats to shoot, okay? So, you are, are this person. What do you think you would do that you just, you just signed the deal, the bank's giving you the money, you just bought the business. What do you think would be the recipe to, to make this thrive? Any ideas? You can't be wrong, okay? Just, just guess. Somebody. You gotta think like the entrepreneur, okay? What would you do? Customers. Customers. You know, sales were, uh, uh, sales were okay. All right? Uh, and you know, in fact, when you do a leverage buyout, you need either more revenue or less cost because you're trying to service debt, okay? Uh, so growing the business would be helpful. He had a plant manager's background. In fact, he was very much not very sales oriented. <laughs> after he was in business 10 years before I got involved in the business and, and I really brought some sales orientation to the company. But good thinking. Anyone else? Yes. So if you don't know about sales, then get someone who does know about it so they can help Right. But, okay, uh, if, if you need more. Yes, no, yeah, it, it, although he was so unsales oriented that really wasn't even a priority. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me go to the next slide and say what he did, okay? You'll get better at this as this goes along. Um, the, what was the formula? Well, the first thing he did was he brought in colleagues from his past that had worked in other manufacturing businesses, and they looked at ways that they could reduce their manufacturing costs so that you could improve, remember, gross margin. Gross margin is so important. One of my favorite sayings in business is a large gross margin will cover a multitude of sins, okay? And you all know what gross margin is? By the way, if you haven't taken an accounting class, you gotta take an accounting class, a financial accounting class, part of your curriculum. You gotta be able to read a P&L and a balance sheet and understand what it's telling you about your business or else you will go broke, okay? So, or if you can't read it, you need somebody who can read it and tell you. you a lot of information's in, it's like reading a health exam and being a doctor. You can't tell what disease a person has if you can't interpret the information. And a financial statement tells you what you need to know. So what he did is he brought in people from his past that he knew that would work well in manufacturing. He consolidated and standardized the product line. It turns out that the sales force, what they use manufacturer reps, would come in, walk down on the factory line and say, well, you know what? If you can make this knob here yellow, I could sell five of these switches. Well, you got the sales force changing your production all the time. And let me tell you, doing customized products in a standard production, in a production facility that makes standard products is very, very expensive and you lose money like crazy. So, so he consolidated this, the product line uh, and brought in people from his past. He relocated the business from the Detroit area into um, uh, Indiana, which was uh, a much more business friendly environment. He got financing from the state of Indiana to build a new factory, put in some updated uh, equipment, and put in good cost management, okay? And, and that was his recipe, and he, he did very, very well uh, over a 30, 40 year period before he retired and basically uh, sold his businesses, all right? So that's the, the first story. Any questions about that, okay? Yes? Yes, yeah. I mean, he, 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 he shut down the, uh, sold, the uh, sold the buildings and then relocated to Indiana, got an industrial revenue bond financing and was able to um, uh, build a brand new plant. Um, the community he moved into wanted to have jobs. They were about to lose their school system. Uh, and um, uh, they welcomed uh, new employers and gave a number of tax inducements. And it was a win for everybody involved. And, and you know, by the way, Entrepreneurs think in terms of win-win. You know, lawyers think in terms of win-lose, okay? 
entrepreneurs win-win, and the people you engage in the transactions you do have to have something in it for everybody. Okay. Any other questions? It was a pro Oh well, you know, uh, actually, in manufacturing, you do this. You, you can do this very easily. You you basically build ahead. Okay, maybe run extra shifts, whatever. So you build an inventory. It's not easy, but it's it's, it's very doable because companies relocate manufacturing operations. I won't say all the time, but certainly from time to time. Okay, and if you've got a good manufacturing background, you know, you build ahead. And, you know, I mean, you do this if you have a union, you feel feel there's a strike happening, you build ahead, so you have a strike bank and all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, the next company um, that I want to talk about was a company located in Georgia. Um, they had about 10 employees. It was a small manufacturer. Um, the entrepreneur might have had a high school degree. I'm not quite sure if he did or not. But he had a real talent for transportation equipment. He was a tr started out as a truck driver. Uh, and then he ran a truck, truck towing uh, service. Then he built uh, uh, towing trucks for a while. Um, but he really understood things related to trucks and, and, and the mechanical parts of trucks and all the parts and things. He had an idea for a better steering stabilizer. Now, a steering stabilizer is mounted between the tie rod and the chassis of the vehicle. And it's, it absorbs shocks to the steering system. You know, if you have a tire failure, it helps you keep control of the, of the truck, et cetera. And um, uh, so most, well, all steering stabilizers up to this point in time were of two types. They were like a giant shock absorber where you had hydraulic damping, or they were mechanical springs, in which case you had um, a resistance, okay? And if there's any math or physics or engineering majors, you know, basically, you know, you have in the old math equation with a damper and a spring and a dash pot, you know, you've got those are the basic elements of a mechanical circuit. And so the spring gives you the mechanical resistance and then the, the shock absorber gives you a derivative of that in the change of force. So his idea was to marry the two together and have a shock absorber with springs around the outside so you had both mechanical and hydraulic resistance. And he decided that he would then take this and put it on the market as the primo product for steering stabilizers. Now, you're once again the entrepreneur. You come up with this idea and you want to get started. And, you, you, and what would you do now? You got the great, the best steering stabilizer there could possibly be. Nobody's ever thought about this. You mixed like peanut butter and jelly together and you created the perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All right, what would you do? How would you get started at this point? Say you had, and you had some money, so you don't, don't worry about raising the money part. You can make these things out, you know, behind your, in your garage at home at night or something. Any ideas? What would be critical to doing well? Pat, who said that? Patent, yes. IP protection. Bingo, that's one thing. You get points. <laughs> what else? What else do you think would be important? All right, yes? Licensing it to someone who has a distribution channel for... You, you know, he could have gone down that route, um, but he decided being a very, you know, independent kind of person, and he decided, well, I'll make these and, and try to get people to buy them. So he really didn't have much in the way of distribution. He could have gone that route, though. Yes? Well, if he had past experience with uh, different businesses, going to the people that he knows, and I guess starting with them to show how it works, that way you can expand from there. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure he probably did that. Uh, uh, you need some customers. My, remember my basic building blocks. And, and yes, he, he probably, I'm sure he did that to develop some of that. OK, um, well, let's talk about what he did. Um, I was hired by, the company was a couple years old and I was hired as a sales, marketing, and engineering manager. Um, he did uh, obtain IP protection, intellectual property protection. He effectively demonstrated the product. Okay, what did he do? This guy has a, little, a lot of sizzle. What he did was, there was these things called truck races where they raced the, uh, the cab part, the bob, bobtail, is that, what, what's the word, honey? Bobtail. Bob, bobtail. They, they race the, um, the bobtail, uh, 
in a truck race, okay? And what he would do is he would mount a plastic explosive to the, next to the right front tire, and then as the, as the truck was going around a curve, he would detonate it and blow the tire up. And at a truck race, it's sort of like, kind of like halftime entertainment in front of these thousands and thousands of people. And he could show how you could steer that vehicle around that bend. And normally, if that's, I mean, not normally, if that same thing would happen on the road, you would wipe out everything around you. So he had real sizzle, okay? Um, he treated, I'm going to skip this one for a second, he treated the customer as king or queen. If you bought his product, you know, you needed to modify this product so it would fit on your vehicle, whether, whatever kind of, I'm talking about heavy vehicles now. So there were mounting black brackets. He would develop the mounting bracket, and once you develop it for, develop it for one chassis, uh, tie rod combination, then it works on the next one. So, but he, he treated the customer as king or queen. He had very little overhead, okay? He had, you drove past this guy's place, and, and it, you know, it was like, our office was in an old house, it looked like a, a three-car garage out back where he made these things. Uh, what people didn't know when they drove by, they were driving by a gold mine, but it looked like a junkyard, okay? Very little overhead. Now, when I came into the business, actually I was trying to buy this business, and he really didn't want to sell, and I eventually came to work for it. Um, one of the issues he had was he had a background in trucking. Now, the problem with the trucking market is they have no money. Okay, it's a low margin business, it's an easy business to get into, hard business to get out of. You know, you have a lot of independent operators, they drive across the country, they, get, they live in Detroit, they get to St. Louis and it's Thursday night, they want to get back home so, so they're home with their family for the weekend, they, they take the trip back uh, at the cost of fuel because they want to get back home. All right, and so the idea is you got all those kind of people messing up pricing in the market. So one of the main I mean, huge contributions I had to this business was I looked at the benefits of this product and I looked at different market segments, whether they're cement mixers, fire trucks, etc. And I found a market for his product that allowed the company to really take off. Okay? Anyone want to guess what market it was that I found for his product? What kind of a vehicle? All right. Class A motorhomes, these big Winnebago's. Okay, think about it. These people have got money. When you have, you got a lot of your money tied up in this rig. You're older. As you get older in life, believe it or not, you get a little bit more sensitive to safety. So the things that you do at 21, not likely to be doing at my age. Okay, because I know what the consequences are if they go wrong. All right. So you get much more attuned to safety as you get older. Also, these people are not professional truck drivers, all right? They didn't go through truck driving school. They don't have a history of this. You know, they, they started with one of those pull-behind pop-up tents, and then over the years, they get into bigger and bigger vehicles. So you got people basically have money, that are concerned about safety, and that don't have the professional skills to handle any type of tire failure on the road. And we marketed our product to that industry, and we took off and did very, very well, okay? So one, another one of my sayings is always do business with customers that have money, all right? Okay, next business. Um, this uh, was in North Carolina. It was an industrial laundry. I had a classmate from uh, Duke that went to work for uh, um, the guy, Michael Millick in the junk bunking, uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert, I think was the name of his company that went under. His father was a Forbes 400. That means he was, his dad was one of the 400 wealthiest people in the United States. And he called me up one day, actually when I was running the, the company in Georgia, and says, I want to go buy this business. He had another business in mind, and I nuked the deal. And we ended up buying an industrial laundry in North Carolina. He basically, we took the assets in the business. We went to BB&T. He took a little stock from his his father and his father's brother started seven, five companies on the New York Stock Exchange. So he took a little bit of his family money and we bought this business, okay? And this laundry, they did retail dry cleaning, they did industrial laundry like shirts, the shirts and uniforms for like uh, gas station attendants or city workers or, or whatever. And then they also did a little bit of hospital linen. And so uh, that's what we bought, all right? And the business was just 
kind of like struggling financially. It wasn't great. I mean, it wasn't making a ton of money, but Ted wanted to buy a business and the seller wanted to sell a business. And when you have somebody who wants to buy and somebody that wants to sell, there's no objections to a deal going down and it went down. So now you, you are Ted and me. You bought this business, which is a hodgepodge of three different kinds of things. What would you do with it? How would you, how would you make it successful? Any ideas? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, by the way, I did not want to do this deal, okay, because what my partner wanted to do was he wanted to focus in, in the hospital business, all right? And uh, I think they did it switch over. There we go. Um, I was the VP of operations. I co-authored the business plan. When I was doing what's called due diligence, which means verification of the facts, when we were putting this deal together, my partner wanted to go into the hospital linen business. He wanted to get rid of the retail, the uniform rental, the floor mats, all that stuff, focus on hospitals, and then market to hospitals to do all their linens, all right? And as I was doing the due diligence, I came across what's called a tunnel washer. Now, when you wash lots of large, and when you wash lots of large volume, you can do it in batch processing, where you have a, like a big washer, you put a load in and then go back 30 minutes later, take that load out and put another load in, okay? Or there was a new technology that's coming out with what's called tunnel washers. A tunnel washer is a continuous flow production process. You know, you keep dumping in dirty laundry on one end and it keeps coming out with clean laundry at the other end and then you run it across a flat iron and you, you dry it and iron it at the same time, okay? So you have a nice continuous flow. Well. In manufacturing, uh, when you're into high volume, low value added, like hospital linen business is, you want a continuous flow production process. You don't want batch processing. You need volume, you need speed, you need low cost. And so we went, we started, we bought this business. He, I told him he was gonna have problems. And, and we, we tripled the sales in one year because my partner was selling, I was running the plant. And if you price your, uh, any type of a commodity business, if you price like 1% below the prevailing market rate on a commodity business, you will have infinite demand, okay? Because the commodity business's price is set at a balance of supply and demand. And there's very little differentiation between products. So, so he priced right below the market and we were flooded. We went from one shift to three shift operation, you know, round the clock. You know, I helped, I even had to help out down in the plant. We were growing so fast, but we weren't making one thing and that's called money. All right. And we, we, we really split up over this because <laughs> I'm in business to make money, not to lose money. And we split up and he actually six months later bought a ton of washer and relocated the plant and did okay after that. So the moral of this story is you've got to have your production strategy in sync um, with um, the, the product line in the market that you're trying to serve. It's very important. You get these things out of sync and if you got the wrong mix, you can lose a lot of money very quickly. All right. The next one is where I, I've currently been the last 10 years. This business was started by a professor at the Medical College of Ohio, which is now part of the University of Toledo, it's now the University of Toledo Medical School, and one of his students who uh, was going through residency training. And these guys, based on their degrees, you can see were quite smart, very academic. It, this is a nice story. It's nice to know that you can get a PhD and be successful in business, okay? And they had some ideas for a business, and they started on their kitchen table with $100,000 from friends and family, okay? And the business was, uh, they were in business 10 years before I got involved with them. And their first product was this product here. And um, the pediatrician who headed up product development as the business grew had an idea of making an ear curette. These are used to remove wax from the ear. When he started this business, uh, these, were, these instruments were all made out of steel. And the problem with a steel instrument like this, similar to a dental instrument, is that when you put it in the ear, 
in order to remove the wax on a patient who has an ear infection, if you hit the ear canal wall or you hit the eardrum, you have, it's very traumatic for the patient because they're already in pain. And many of the patients are kids. And it, you know, I don't know if you remember, but when you're a kid, you usually get a lot of ear infections. And the first thing the doctor does is remove the wax from the ear so that you can see, have an unobstructed view of the eardrum. Well, back in the early 80s, most of the wax were being removed by specialists, ENT specialists. And by making this instrument out of plastic, we call it a safe ear curette, it's more flexible and it moved the procedure from the higher cost ENT labor to a pediatrician or a family practitioner or a lower cost labor and, and it just took off. It really, we, this business really grew um, by uh, off this product. The other product line that we that they developed was radiation therapy equipment because this guy had a background in, in radiation oncology and we make they we develop all kinds of positioning devices to position the patient um, while they're getting radiation therapy treatment this would be you know patients that have cancer when you have cancer you basically have three options you can uh, use chemo which is drugs you can use surgery to remove the tumor, or you can use radiation, which is like dropping a missile onto the tumor, and you want to blow it up and not get any lot of collateral damage. And so we make the devices that restrain the patient while they're getting radiated so that they don't move around a lot, okay? So those are the two products. So, so they had an, these ideas, and let's focus mostly really on, on this idea, the ear curette one. And so now this is you. You're, you're, you're one of these two guys, either the teacher or the, or the student going through residency training. You got the idea for the ear curette, okay? How do you get started in business? And you know, you're both raising families, you got kids. This guy is probably a little bit more, well, at that time you assume they, neither one really had much money. Um, what would you do? Okay, I already gave you the hint here. They raise money from friends and family so they could get into business. How do you get your business now off the ground? How do you get customers? How do you get people sending you money so that you can grow? Any ideas? Okay, well, it turns out that the, I, the, the key idea they came up with was to, I'm gonna shift this one, well, they got a patent, okay, very important. They st started sampling this product. What they would do is they would send this out, in a little, a two, two of these out in an envelope to doctor's offices. Every time they send out 100, they would get 12 orders. And they go, wow, that's really great. So the next month they'd send out 200 and they got 24 orders. And so this thing uh, is like a perpetual motion machine. The more they fed it, the more orders they got, and they would make enough off their orders to more than cover the cost of sending out samples, okay? And this was a key to getting the business started. And they also then, when they got large enough, then they'd start going to trade shows, okay? Um, that's how they got the thing going. And then over the years, you know, we continued to innovate at Bionics. Uh, when normally the way you use this instrument, you pull the ear back, you look in with an otoscope, you set the otoscope down, that's the thing with the light, you know, with the black tip, and then you go in the ear and you, you move it around and you, you get a little wax on it, you, you splat it down on a, on a towel and go get some more, but you can't see what you're doing. So um, about seven years ago, we came up with this instrument here, a lighted ear curette, and we said, wow, you know, if we could make the curette light up, then when you're using it, you can see what you're doing. Now, we're the only company in the world that makes a lighted ear curette, and that's patented too. And we have about 80% of the market for this product, okay? And we sell these in 50 countries, all right? Um, that, but the idea is you need to continually innovate in manufacturing. We also then came up with the idea of a forcep because kids stick things in their nose and ears, and so we have a forcep uses the same technology, and you can reach in and grab uh, foreign, we call it foreign bodies out of your ear and nose. Uh, another key aspect of their success is they have a very flexible work environment. I mean, we have very little turnover. We have about 75 employees. Maybe one person leaves our company a year at, at most. And so every year you're in business, there's another 75 years of, you know, of experience that you get. All right? So 
those are four, four stories from my past, different entrepreneurs I work with. Look, what's imp what I want you to take away from this is that you can come from any walk of life. It takes a, great I it takes a good idea and you need to think about what is really going to be critical for you to be successful, all right? And what it is in one business is different than another one, okay? I mean, yeah, you have to have employees, you got to have customers, et cetera, but, but the key critical issue is to make that business take off and, and it is different. Each, each, one's, each one's got its own set of issues, all right? So what were the main lessons I learned from, from all these entrepreneurs? Two routes to entrepreneurship. Start a business, you need an idea. Buy a business, then you need a plan to grow sales, as was brought up, or reduce costs, and or reduce cost. Look, at your age, it's gonna be tough if you don't come from a, a family with got a lot of money to be able to buy a business of any significance because who is going to loan money to you? You know, you're unproven, all right? So starting a business is the way most young entrepreneurs get started, okay? because you know, there's no lending institution that's going to bet on you yet because you don't have that track record. All right? You want to know what problem you're solving. There, I can't emphasize enough, understanding the problem that the customer has. And part of that is doing good market research. Okay? Uh, you don't want to overanalyze things. This is where engineers and techies sometimes get in trouble because look, in engineering you're always trying to optimize something to come up with the best. I mean, you know, in business, what you need is solutions, and you can't wait friggin' forever for them, okay? You need decisions, so you have to be careful not to overanalyze things. IP protection, intellectual property protection, is very helpful. Think about the business as a system, okay? Uh, you know, you're the conductor, you have an orchestra, how are you gonna make something beautiful out of the assets you have to work with? What are, what's the, the critical mix of things? You know, how are you gonna get your customers, your pricing, you have the right production process, you gotta think really in a holistic manner. All right, assemble the right team with a mix of skills. Um, getting the right people together. You can't do it all yourself, and so you, you have to look at, you have to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. Just like the one that had that, that turned around the manufacturing business, he knew he wasn't a salesperson, okay? He knew his strength was manufacturing, but you still gotta have somebody some way to sell, to manage your sales force or your manufacturer rep network. You gotta have somebody who's gonna do the accounting. But so you gotta get the right team. And he was very smart in bringing together the critical people on the manufacturing side from his past. Uh, the right production process for your business. Do business with customers that have money. A large gross margin covers a multitude of sins. I just love this one. This is my first rule of business, okay? You're gonna make mistakes, all right? If you have a low margin business, there's not much money left over after making your product or service to pay for those sins, all right? So if you have a large gross margin, you can make mistakes and you won't go out of business. And nothing seeps into business like cost, okay? So you have to be vigilant when, ca when your capital resources are limited about how you're spending the money. Any questions on that? Okay, my last slide. What can you do now to prepare yourself to be an entrepreneur. Um, first, if I was, again, if I was in your shoes 30 years ago, what would I, what, 30 years ago, I guess that's right, yeah, 30 years ago, uh, what would I, what would I wanna know? You know, put in, develop a vision of what you wanna become. Do you wanna be a manufacturing entrepreneur? Do you wanna be, you know, a, have some sort of a tech service business, whatever? Try to get in your mind what it is that will make you be passionate about. Identify your strengths. You're not gonna be able to do it all yourself. You win in life by playing off your strengths and surrounding strong people that are good at where your weaknesses are. So know what they are. I mean, know if you're, if you're a sales-oriented person or if you're the product developer. I remember when Steve, when Steve Jobs started Apple Computer, he was not the techie. That was Wozniak, okay? He was the marketing genius behind it. Um, develop strong organizational skills. This is even more important than when I started in business. I'm astounded that even the world can operate with email anymore. The number of emails that I, that I get in my own small organization 
in the previous business I was in, it's incredible. Any large company, in fact, some of the companies like Pfizer don't even allow their sales force to send emails anymore between eight and five because these businesses are just drowning in information and in data, okay? Every day, organizations wake up and they say, God, please give me some decisions today. And what they get is lots of dialogue about decisions, all right? And the fact is, there are very few decisions that will sink a company, but the inability to make one will very quickly. And so you have to find a way to have good organizational skills for dealing with the enormous amount of information that's going to flow across your desk. And you've got to figure that out, because if you, if you get out of control and you don't, you're not well organized, I mean, you're going to get out of control by not being well organized, You've got to get a good system together for dealing with information. Get experience outside the classroom working with people. Because business is a social experience, it's not about getting all the right answers right on the test, although it's important that you can read a P&L and a balance sheet, all right? Uh, you gotta, that's a class you want to get an A in, <laughs> all right? Uh, but you've got to get experience working with people because that's how it's won. That's how the game of business is won, by having a great team that works well together, that responds to your leadership, okay? Uh, get some work experience. You know, find, if, you, if you think you want to be in whatever field, find a job, get in there, even if it's just on, uh, you know, you're donating your time. You got to get into the game of the industry you want to be in. Start saving now, because there, uh, when you first get started, you're going to have to be spending money on patents or whatever in order to, to be able to have enough of a business together to attract capital. Learn what's going on around you. I mean, I'm here today because of an individual at your school, Timmy, who I met on a ski lift, who was not on his friggin' smartphone doing all this shit, okay, and engaged in a conversation with another person on a ski lift and we hit it off. He's, he, he's in your entrepreneurial classes and, and he, listen, you know, he was listening to my story and we we're talking back and forth and, and then that led to this opportunity today. He would not have found me on this friggin' smartphone, okay? There's a role for smartphones and internet and all that stuff, but I'm telling you, I see people missing out on life because they're engaged in emails and all this other crap and they're not engaged in the world around them, and that's where you're going to much more likely to see opportunity in the world around you, okay? Um, at the university, you got people, all these different departments. I mean, for those of you, if you're mostly, if you're business students, hang around with some people in the, you know, in the engineering, to, uh, in the engineering area, because, you know, they probably got some technology, some ideas, and you've got a business background, you two should get together. This is, these are the, if you're a business person, you should be partying on Friday night with engineers, all right? You'll find that they're very easy to party with because nobody else is talking to them, <laughs> all right? And if you're the engineer, seek out the business school students. When I did the conference at Stanford and at Duke, it was a joint conference between business school students and engineering students. This is where the great companies are, are, are come about, by the mix of some business and technical talent. Um, develop some mentors and advisors. You, you know, the fact is, you know, when you're, when you're your age, you think you know it all. And indeed, you know everything there is to know about the fishbowl you live in. <laughs> all right? You haven't been, you haven't had experience in most cases to get out there and really understand how business is conducted, how you lose orders, how you lose customers, how you win customers, how you grow businesses, etc. And you want somebody further down the road that takes an interest in your life, your career, your future to help you. Now look, you don't have to do that, but it's going to cost you a hell of a lot more money. I'll give you a great story. I hired a guy two years ago, 60-year-old guy. Couldn't, uh, he, 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 made, he, sold, he was a national sales manager for Electa. Electa was one of the top two manufacturers of linear accelerators. These are $3 million pieces of equipment that shoot the radiation beam, for which we make the $10,000 to $40,000 piece of equipment that restrains the patient. And he had retired from Electa, and he didn't have a college background, and uh, he thought he was set in life, and then after two years of retirement, his wife of 30 years decided she wanted a divorce. Nothing kills your wealth like a divorce, because split everything in two. Now he has to go back to work. 60, 
no college degree, you know, what are you going to do to get back in the game? And he left at the top of his game. I ran an ad in the paper and he's, uh, about looking for somebody for sales for a regional account manager position. He sent in his resume. He didn't really know what we did because I sent it to a blind box. I didn't describe what we, blind PO box. I got his resume. I called him. I said, please come in, be in tomorrow morning. He sat down at, and for the interview, and the first thing I told him was, I have already hired you in my mind. The only thing you can do is lose this job uh, in this interview, my job offer. It's the only thing that can happen to you, because I've hired you in my mind, because I knew how valuable that 30 years of experience was selling these $3 million pieces of equipment. I'll get to my point of how this ties to my last point. Anyway, I hired him. Uh, he said, you know, he told me later, you know, Scott, I, 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 I'm so grateful because I sent out a thousand resumes. I only got two interviews, and you were one of the two. And that was over a six month period. Anyway, I hired him, and then uh, when I, got, uh, I was approached by a, a young guy out of school that had a uh, ex military, I love military people because they follow, follow the chain of command. Anyways, uh, and this 60 year old guy was ex military too. And so I took the 23-year-old and I said, look, you're going to shadow the 60-year-old for the next six months. You're going to support his sales efforts. He's going to handle a region of the country. You're his inside support person. And this 60-year-old and this 25-year-old hit it off so well that he tra so much of the 60-year-old's experience was translated into this 25-year-old kid. And and in six months, in one year actually, I took the 60-year-old, made him our national sales manager, took the 25, and, he, and the 60-year-old had the top sales record in our company. Uh, and, and I told him he would. He had it in four months. So he came, he, the 60-year-old becomes the national sales manager, the 25-year-old moves into the territory that the 60-year-old had, and six months later beat the 60-year-old's sales record, okay? This is how you accomplish that kind of greatness by taking experience and mixing it with the passion of a young person. All right? So that's why you want to have mentors and advisors. And then lastly, pursue opportunities for which you have a passion because it won't seem like work. So that's my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions.